Wormald from Adelaide, Australia. He's a very old friend and uh, exceptional, excellent surgeon and man. And uh, I asked to him to talk something more uh, common for ENT people, especially how to deal with the nasal obstruction problem or, or nasal obstruction airway. So I asked to him to talk about septoplasty, turbinates, etc. It's very controversial issues. He has a, a new technique regarding the turbinates and you are very anxious to, to listen to you. Uh, my friend, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and to stay with us uh, tonight in Brazil and very early in the morning in Adelaide. So good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you very much for the Brazilian NT Society for supporting us, as well the Academy, Brazilian Academy of Rhinology, uh, our whole institution, uh, Hospital Edmundo Vasconcelos in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, thanks to Marcelo uh, Sangrati the, from Gravasson, he's uh, offered us the simultaneous translation for this, uh, this lecture. Uh, Camila Dassi, she is uh, uh, our coordinator of international uh, ENT live stream. And I think it's uh, very, very, very soon all these lectures will be available in our website. Uh, before this introduction, after this introduction, I'm sorry, I like to pass the the pass to the court, the moder our moderator dr leonardo bossalobri to introduce uh, uh, the panelists and start uh, the works tonight please leonardo before this i would like to ask camila to explain ah, yes, yes explain how uh, our translation. translation please camila Camila, Camila, you... Camila, you have to open to open your sound. You are muted. Yeah. <laughs> Desculpa. Uh, então, é o seguinte. Primeiro, eu vou explicar para quem quer ouvir em português. É só em interpretation, que é esse mundinho na barra inferior da tela. E trocar para português, você vai escutar o áudio que não é o áudio original, que é o áudio do tradutor. Se você quiser ouvir o áudio original, todas as perguntas, a palestra e todas as perguntas serão feitas no áudio original, que é o áudio em inglês. E você pode fazer essa troca durante a aula. E é isso. Ok, Leonardo, go ahead. Thank you, Camila. And if you have question, please use the, the, the bottom key and A. Uh, we can use the chat just to, to make some uh, Consideration, but I would like I would like you to use Q and A for questions, and after the presentation, we're gonna uh, make some questions. Well, uh, Aldo already introduced Professor Warmold. It's an honor for us having you also again, uh, because it's too early over there. Actually, it's already tomorrow for for us. He's uh, tomorrow, and uh, we're gonna have with us as a panelist that will make questions. Dr. João Mangusi Gomes, uh, he's from Brasilia, a rhinologist and scoby surgeon. Uh, Professor Renato Reutemann, uh, he's from Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, Professor Yanti, da Universidade Luterana. Professor uh, Rodrigo Paula Santos from Sao Paulo, and Unifest, Universidade Federal de São Paulo, and Professor Miguel Tepedino from Rio de Janeiro, uh, Policlinica Botafogo, and uh, UFRJ. Uh, so thank you again, Professor Warmold. Uh, take your time. Thank you again. You can go. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Well, it's very early here. Yeah? It's good evening, I suppose, in, uh, in Brazil. Um, we hope you're all uh, staying safe in our troubled times that we have at the moment with the, uh, the COVID virus. We, we're doing pretty well here in Adelaide. Uh, South Australia has not had a single new infection for nearly a month now. So um, things are, are returning to normal here. So we, we wish you well in Brazil and, and hope things will improve there soon. So um, Aldo asked me to um, present something which is uh, commonplace to most ENT surgeons. And I think that you'll find that most ENT surgeons uh, will uh, really need to deal with the nasal airway. Um, and the nasal airway is a really important um, 
symptom that patients will present with. Uh, and we, we know that um, the nasal airway is something that uh, will take precedence over um, a lot of other uh, areas within the nasal and sinus cavity, because if you don't get the nasal airway correct, then surgery on the other parts of the sinuses will often not be successful. So it's really important that we address that nasal airway. So um, I just have my disclaimers, and none of them are, are relevant to my presentation today. Um, the aims today is I'm going to discuss nasal airflow because I don't think there's a very good understanding of nasal airflow. And so I would um, want you to have a clear picture at the end of this lecture exactly where the air flows in the nose and what that physiology looks like. We're also going to discuss all of the factors that can contribute to nasal obstruction because each factor plays a role and we need to understand each one of these factors separately, but then in conjunction together with each other, how they affect the... Outros, claro, para ver como eles vão afetar e causar, então, a obstrução nasal. As técnicas de septoplastia, septoplastia é uma técnica conhecida, né? mas há várias cirurgiões que não fazem a septoplastia muito bem. E há septoplastias que são mais fáceis e há casos mais difíceis também, claro. E eu vou identificar quais são difíceis e, quais, e por que são difíceis. E como você pode é, lidar com essas septoplastias mais difíceis. Vou falar também sobre tubinectomia inferior, os cornetos inferiores. Ou inferior terminoplasty. E eu vou passar por essas. E eu vou apresentar para você what I think is anatomy, which is not well understood about the inferior terminate and about how this anatomy is dealt with when we do a terminoplasty. We're also going to talk about middle terminate surgery because middle terminate surgery, as you'll see when we go through the physiology of the nasal airflow, also plays a very important role in uh, the um, management of the nasal airway. So we need to address the middle ter uh, uh, terminate as well. And then we're going to go through a whole lot of examples in terms of each presenting of each patient to see uh, when we present that patient, how do we assess the nasal airway in each one of these examples that we'll go through. But let's look at nasal obstruction. So nasal obstruction is probably one of the most common symptoms that uh, rhinology patients will present with. And what happens is that if patients can't breathe, then they uh, uh, have difficulty sleeping at night. And so here you can see an example of a patient who's got a very large inferior turbinate touching up against the septum, the actual nasal airway is significantly obstructed. And then the patient will end up snoring because he's breathing through his mouth, he's not breathing through his nose. And uh, this has problems for the marital relationships often where the, uh, the wife uh, or the husband, whichever, is uh, so frustrated by the fact that the patient is snoring and, and um, uh, having a nasally obstructed airway at night that things don't look so good, especially when you wake up in the morning, uh, you're not feeling 100% uh, as a consequence of not sleeping well overnight. So we really need to uh, be able to address this common problem. Here we have, these are actual patients. So this is a nasal airflow diagram of actual patients of ours. So this is not simulated, this is done for actual patients. And here you can see the pink, the pink area is the area of maximal airflow. So here you can see what happens this is very anterior. So this is at the region of the internal nasal valve. So we can see at the region of the internal nasal valve, the airflow is maximized in this particular region here between the septum and the head of the inferior turbinate. So the head of the inferior turbinate and the septum uh, is the rate limiting step here. And as we start to go further in 
to the nasal cavity, we can see that the inferior turbinate is here and that the air airflow is on the shoulder, on the top of the shoulder of the inferior turbinate. As we go further into the nose, we start to see the inferior turbinates visible here and the majority of the airflow is sitting up in the superior meatus, just below the um, beginnings here of the middle turbinate uh, and on the top of the shoulder of the inferior turbinate. And here we can see the middle turbinate in place and we can see how the airflow is present through that middle meatus uh, region. The yeah, middle turbinate is here and the airflow is here. And so understanding how the nasal airflow works is critical in our decision making as to what needs to be addressed in each particular patient as to where the area of obstruction is. So if we look at this animation, so this animation is the actual patient again. Here we can see the middle turbinate, we can see the inferior turbinate, and the region of airflow we can see is maximized here. And we can see what happens, internal nasal valve, airflow comes through, there's a stream going higher up into the olfactory region. So there's a stream going higher up into the olfactory region, and then there's a stream that comes through here. And then we can see uh, around that middle meatus, there's a lot of turbulent airflow as well. But the majority of this, the airstream is through over the shoulder of that inferior turbinate, around that middle turbinate in the middle meatus as we go further back. Here we have the opposite nostril. So same patient. This is the uh, opposite nostril. This is the patient's right hand side. And here we can see what happens with the nasal airflow. The majority of the nasal airflow coming through, striking the anterior end of the middle terminate, passing down that middle meatus, turbulent flow inferiorly, turbulent flow up here around that olfactory region, uh, and then the majority of the airflow going down and out through the nasopharynx. So understanding this, this is actual patient breathing, and each of these particles are labeled particles which are seen to be traveling how they travel through that particular uh, patient's nasal cavity. So if you look at it from the front, so we can see here, this is the area of the uh, anterior nasal valve. Here we have uh, middle turbinate, and we can see how the airflow passes uh, over the shoulder of the inferior turbinate and through uh, underneath the uh, middle turbinate and then down into the nasopharynx. And we can see what actually happens. There's recirculation of air, there's turbulence of that airflow. All of this helps with the humidification and the warming of the air, which are the primary uh, um, reasons why we have the nasal airflow uh, physiologically as we do through the nose at the moment. This is a different patient now. So these are actual patients. This is not uh, just a simulation. This is an actual patient. And you can see in this patient, the airflow is a little bit more well, how we would see it to be traditional in the fact that there's more airflow through the inferior meatus in this particular patient. But still, the majority of that airflow is going over the shoulder of the inferior turbinate. I keep emphasizing over the shoulder of the inferior turbinate because one of the key aspects that we need to understand is that we need to keep the turbinates in a torpedo shape because it's that torpedo shape that allows the airflow to move between the shoulder of the inferior terminate and the middle meatus and through the inferior meatus. If you lose that torpedo shape of the inferior terminate, you start to disrupt this physiology of this nasal airflow quite significantly. So you really want to make sure that whatever we do in the nasal cavity, we preserve that torpedo shape uh, of those turbinates to be able to preserve that nasal airflow. Here you look at it from the top, so superiorly, internal nasal valve, 
middle turbinate, nasal cavity, middle meatus. We can see this patient's had previous surgery. So there's some penetration of the maxillary sinus through a surgically created um, middle meatal antrostomy. So if you look at it, most of the airflow is in this direction. So if we look at what actually happens, so here we have the head of the inferior turbinate and the head of the inferior turbinate we can see directs the nasal airflow to a certain extent through the rest of the nasal cavity. So if you disrupted the torpedo shape of the head of the inferior turbinate, you'll often disrupt this nasal airflow direction. And the importance is to see that the majority of the nasal airflow goes from the internal nasal valve upwards and backwards towards the middle meatus. The majority of the airflow doesn't go through the inferior meatus. So a lot of surgeons think that the majority of the airflow goes through the inferior meatus and they concentrate all of their surgical technique on the inferior turbinate. But we can see that physiologically, that's not correct. That the majority of the airflow is directed in an upwards and backwards direction towards the middle turbinate, not in the inferior meatus along the floor of the nose. So we really need to make sure that this is the area that we need to ensure is correctly addressed surgically so that we can improve that nasal airflow and the sensation of nasal airflow. A lot of people, and there's been quite a lot of discussion about the empty nose syndrome. Where does it come from? What is it? How does it develop? What are the factors that contribute towards the empty nose syndrome? One of the major reasons that patients get an empty nose syndrome is that the shoulder of the inferior terminate is taken away or disrupted. The airflow receptors are prominent here where the maximum airflow is. You don't have a lot of airflow receptors back in the inside of the nose. Most of the airflow receptors are here on the head of the inferior turbinate and especially on the upper shoulder of that inferior turbinate. So if we want to make sure that we um, don't have a patient that develops empty nose syndrome after our surgery, we need to preserve these airflow receptors. So the patient has a sense of resistance. So this shoulder of the inferior turbinate gives the patient resistance to nasal airflow. And that resistance is perceived by the speed of that airflow across the surface of the upper shoulder of that inferior turbinate. And that then gives the sensation of nasal patency to the patient. And you will have a patient who feels that they've got a good airflow through the nose. If you disrupt this significantly by taking away the whole of the inferior turbinate, including the head surgically, you can often end up with a patient who doesn't have airflow receptors, and even though they have got good airflow through their nose, their perception is one of nasal obstruction. Here again, you can see the middle terminate dividing that stream. From the top here again, you can see this is a different patient. The speed at which the nasal airflow moves and the fact that the nasal airflow moves from the vestibule in an upwards direction. It doesn't move along the floor. It moves at almost a 45 degree angle from the floor of the nose back into the nasal cavity. And this area here, again, internal nasal valve being a area of the highest speed of nasal airflow within the nasal cavity. So just illustrating this 45 degree angle of nasal airflow, which is really important to understand uh, when we look at our patients and when we assess the patient's nasal airway for further treatment and management. So what creates the sensation of nasal obstruction? So there, 
are four things that we really need to assess in every patient. So we need to assess the patient's septum. We need to assess the patient's inferior turbinates, middle turbinates, and we need to assess whether there's significant contributory inflammation from associated chronic sinusitis. All of these four factors play a role. In different patients, different factors become more important. And so we need to assess all of these factors in each patient because if you address the patient's septum and they've got bad sinus disease and you don't deal with the sinus disease, you're not going to get a good outcome for the patient. The same if you just do surgery on the inferior turbinates and you don't address the septal deviation, again, you won't have the patient with a free-flowing air through the nose. So each one of these factors has to be assessed individually in each patient. There are also important principles in septoplasty that we really need to understand. The most important factor in a septoplasty is identifying the correct surgical plane. So I always teach, when I'm teaching surgeons how to do septoplasty, is there are two things that you have to get right with the septoplasty. You have to get the surgical plane correct. If you're not in the surgical plane, the surgery becomes a mess. It becomes bloody, and you don't get the dissection clean, and you don't have the ability to stop um, septal tears. You have to keep one flap intact. So when you're assessing the septum, we've got to make sure that you take one flap and identify either the left or the right flap, which is going to be the easier flap to work on and make sure that you don't create a tear on that one side. When you have a very prominent surgical spur, the mucosa is stretched across that spur so tightly that often it's not even possible to remove that spur without having a tear in that mucosa. So you know that when you have a very sharp prominent spur in the septum, there's a high likelihood that you're going to end up with a tear over that very prominent spur where the mucosa has been stretched so tightly. Therefore, if you don't keep the opposite flap intact, you're going to end up with a problem. And so it's critical that you do these two things correctly when you're doing a septoplasty. First of all, identify the surgical plane. Secondly, keep one flap intact. This very sharp spurs significantly tension the uh, mucosa over those areas. And while our surgical technique will often try and release that pressure by fracturing above and below the spur and trying to move the spur more medially before we do the dissection around the spur, even with those surgical techniques, in some instances, you're going to end up with a surgical tear. You also have patients, especially patients who are older, patients who in their 60s or 70s, um, who end up with mucosa that doesn't have a high degree of integrity. So the mucosa is often a bit like wet tissue paper. So it tears very easily. And so in these patients, again, critical that you keep one flap intact as you go. We tend to always take all of the bone away around a tear. If you create a tear and you don't remove that surgical bone, that's prominence of bone, that the tear was uh, where the tear occurred, that bone that you've left behind will tent the flap up 
And the a empurrar of... o retalho de mucosa, ele tende a criar um pico ali que vai manter a lesão aberta, vai manter a mucosa aberta. Então é importante retirar todo esse osso ao redor do esporão para que o retalho fique bem próximo à mucosa do outro lado e você possa suturar ali então ao final da septoplastia. Então vocês estão vendo, gente, é, é, é essa você tem que tentar suturar a, a mucosa. Eu vou mostrar a técnica para vocês em um vídeo daqui a pouco. Aqui é um vídeo de uma septoplastia básica, que nós estamos vendo o desvio septal do paciente, do lado esquerdo aqui do paciente, corneta inferior aqui do lado direito. Então, nós estamos entrando aqui. Tem um esporão aqui, ó. vocês estão vendo aqui o esporão, né? vocês estão vendo a obstrução na cavidade nasal, vocês estão vendo aqui a presença do esporão no lado contralateral, aqui é um desvio anterior e o esporão do outro lado. E aqui, então, nós infiltramos a mucosa. O que nós fazemos aqui, vocês estão vendo? A septoplastia básica, a incisão básica, ela é feita bem anteriormente. Tá? Aqui vocês estão vendo, aqui está a borda da, da cartilagem lateral, é, que é, é a borda da cartilagem lateral inferior. Então, esse aqui é o referencial anatômico que eu utilizo para fazer a incisão aqui na mucosa. Então, usa aqui a parte de trás do, do bisturi para elevar aqui, para descolar essa borda aqui. Eu elevo essa borda, descolo aqui, aí faço a incisão no ângulo de 45 graus aqui com a lâmina de bisturi para eu entrar na mucosa né, e eu posso sentir a ponta da lâmina. E aí eu faço essa incisão curva, em curvatura para baixo. É muito importante fazer a incisão. Que você pode todas as septal deviations on both sides. We don't want to have a deviation anterior to our incision. If you have a deviation anterior to your incision, you can't come back towards yourself once you've made your incision. You can't deal with anything anterior to your incision. That's why you need to have identified where the deviation is and have placed your incision anterior to that deviation. We will always try and preserve as much of the septal cartilage as we can and only resect from either a fracture line or from the bony cartilaginous junction posteriorly. <clears throat> we make our incision, curve the incision down, make sure that we're in the correct plane. If you're not in the correct plane, this doesn't dissect well. Here we can see fractures in the cartilage and we can see that there are often attachments to those fractures as we elevate that up. We're working around that spur now. We're going below the spur. There's the spur above us. We work below the spur. We work above the spur. Our flap's now intact. We can go across that bony cartilaginous junction. We can remove all the bone. I pre very rarely will preserve any of the septal bone posterior to our cartilaginous septum. I like to preserve as much of the cartilage as we can, but I have no... Um, compulsion in removing all of the septal bone. So I don't have any uh, desire to preserve any of the bone. I we'll want to dissect the flap onto the floor on both sides. You will see we go all the way down. This is an anterior deviated part of the cartilage which we've taken out. This is the septal spur. We fracture the spur, try and take the pressure here off the spur that we were gonna take off and then we put our septum back. And we can see that we have a very nice septum on both sides. We then put our sutures in to close the incision up. So making sure that we have our um, sutures in and that incision is then closed up. How do we do the suturing? Well, at the one end of the stitch, we have a knot. And then we placate the stitch, the septum all the way up and then just through the skin, tie the suture on itself uh, through the skin. You can't do this knot, this tying of the suture on the mucosa because it just will tear. It has to have a structural integrity so it's the skin is important just to tie the suture. You see the knot and then we have uh, our placation suture all the way up. So if we look at the inferior turbinate surgery techniques, so there's been a lot of techniques described 
for um, surgery on the inferior turbinate. There's total inferior turbinectomy, partial inferior turbinectomy, diathermy of the turbinates, submucous diathermy, coblation, and then turbinoplasty, which we will discuss now. What happens with total inferior turbinectomy? Well, the whole turbinate is chopped off. The problem with that is you're exposing the significant blood vessels that come in from the back of the inferior turbinate. So when you're exposing those blood vessels, you have a much higher chance of getting postoperative uh, bleeding afterwards. Much higher chance of crusting because you've got a significant raw area and a problem with atrophic rhinitis and empty nose syndrome because you've removed a lot of the functional mucosa from that nasal cavity. Uh, generally speaking, patients who've had uh, total inferior turbinectomy often feel their nasal airflow air has improved. The problem with empty nose syndrome, as I said to you, what happens when patients have had their turbinates completely resected is they lose their airflow receptors. And the most important area for airflow receptors is on the shoulder of the inferior turbinate. And that's why it's important that you deal with that. Partial inferior turbinectomy, again, because you've chopped right the way through the turbinate, the risk of postoperative hemorrhage, again, a risk of uh, crusting, a less, a smaller risk of atrophic rhinitis and empty nose syndrome because you haven't removed the entire turbinate, you still have functional turbinate. But again, in general, most patients do feel there's some improvement in their nasal airflow afterwards. Submucous and surface diathermy of the turbinate, very old traditional technique. You put your um, cautery needle uh, underneath the mucosa of the inferior turbinate, and you have three passes, one over the top, one down the medial surface, and one at the bottom. So three passes of your needle as you do that. Always have significant swelling afterwards. You still get necrosis and hemorrhage as post-operative risks. Generally speaking, they have a reasonable outcome, but the long-term outcome for this procedure is not nearly as good as the um, uh, where you've removed bone and tissue itself. Coblation, again, you're dealing with removal of the mucosa. It's a soft tissue only. It's expensive because you need the wand, and really the outcomes are not nearly as good as what it is otherwise. So turbinoplasty, I believe the most important thing about a turbinoplasty is removal of the bone. If you don't remove the bone of the inferior turbinate, you don't end up with a long-term improvement in your outcome. So it's really important to remove the bone of the inferior turbinate. What we want to do is preserve most of the medial mucosa of that inferior turbinate. So you, the, the medial mucosa is the functional mucosa. So that's the mucosa that holds the airflow receptors. It's also the mucosa that gives you the humidification uh, of your nasal airflow and the warming of the air as it passes over the mucosa of that inferior turbinate. So removing the bone but preserving the mucosa is one of the critical aspects of a turbinoplasty. You also want to preserve that torpedo shape because we could see when we looked at the physiology of nasal airflow, how important it is to have the torpedo shape maintained. Uh, and turbinoplasty is a minimal risk of hemorrhage because we always address the uh, blood vessels directly when we perform a inferior turbinoplasty. And because you've preserved the mucosa and you don't have large raw surfaces, you get minimal crusting in the post-operative period. It does take more time to do though. So you do have to have the patience and uh, the time to take uh, when you do your turbinoplasty so that your patient gets a really good outcome. If we look at the anatomy of the inferior turbinate, and this is why I think it's so important that we understand the surgical technique and the vascular um, anatomy of the inferior turbinate. So here we have a typical inferior turbinate. We can see that there's a lot of spicules, 
and areas of corrugation on the inferior turbinate. But you'll also notice that there are three major little canals. And those three major canals will carry the major blood vessels of the inferior turbinate and the, the, the blood supply of that inferior turbinate. Again, you can see all the corrugations that we uh, can see on the inferior turbinate. And we can see how by removing the bone of the inferior turbinate, we are able to improve that nasal cavity airflow without disruption of the mucosa. So this is what I've been talking about, the shoulder of the inferior turbinate, which is this area here. And this is the area here where the airflow is directed in a 45 degree angle towards the middle meatus that we would need to um, preserve so that we preserve the airflow receptors in this area. So this is a cadaver dissection of the blood vessels of the inferior turbinate. So here we can see at the back of the inferior turbinate, the branch of the descending palatine artery comes in. And typically we will have three branches. We have a superior medial branch, an inferior lateral branch, and a branch here which is inferior medial. So typically there are three branches uh, of the blood vessels of the inferior turbinate. Here we can see we did 16 cadavers, 50 patients in which we identified uh, all of these blood vessels to see what proportion of patients had which blood vessels in place. So 60% of the cadavers and the patients had three arteries, one, two, and three. 30% had two arteries, and 10% had four or more arteries. So there's often quite a lot of vascular anastomosis between these arteries in the inferior terminate as well. So this is the most common artery that we've seen in all of our dissections. So 96% of patients have a superior medial artery, 82% have a lateral inferior artery, and 70% have an inferior medial artery. So those three arteries are the most common arteries that we will see when we do a turbinoplasty. The other important anatomy, which really is poorly understood, is that the vast proportion of the blood supply of the inferior turbinate comes from a branch from the descending palatine artery and not a branch of the sphenopalatine artery, which was previously described. So if you look at all the textbooks, they will say the sphenopalatine artery does, divides and then you have a branch from the sphenopalatine artery that comes down to the head of the inferior turbinate to form, to give the blood supply. That's not the case in the majority of the patients and cadaver dissections that we did we could see that this branch actually came from the descending palatine artery. So 70% had a major contribution from the descending palatine artery. Uh, and then there was some uh, other contributions from the other blood vessels. So here we have the inferior turbinate. So the first thing you can see we do, the first thing we do is we create a little window. So there's two things we want to do. We want to preserve this mucosa here. This mucosa we can remove because we want to identify the bone within the inferior turbinate. So we take the microdebrider and just create a little window and then take the mucosa off the lateral aspect. We then identify the surgical plane between the bone of the inferior turbinate and then using a dental elevator, we can then elevate the mucosa off the bone. And as we elevate the mucosa here, you can see the medial superior blood vessel lies in a, often in an actual canal itself or on a, in, a, in a groove along that medial aspect. So here we will visualize that vessel as we do that dissection. We will take that vessel and you can see it coming out of its canal now as we dissect it out of the canal. So as we come down inferiorly, we start to see the inferior uh, and lateral uh, blood vessel. Taking all the bone out, see all the medial mucosa is preserved, removing the bone, 
We're going to go right the way back. Here's the superior medial vessel. And you can see that as we get back, you start to see how there's all these uh, anastomoses of these blood vessels at the posterior end of the inferior turban. So it's really important that we identify all of these vessels coming through. We take our bipolar cautery and we cauterize these vessels from the back end of that inferior turban. And, the, and what this does is we can then visualize these vessels. So here's that superior medial vessel, the very prominent one, as the inferior medial vessel. So these are the two major vessels here. This one actually splits into two here, and then the inferior lateral vessel here. So we've identified all of the vessels. We now then cauterize those, because if you've cauterized them here, then you don't have to worry about postoperative hemorrhage as a problem in the postoperative period. So then we roll that turbinate laterally. And we can see what we've done is we've maintained the torpedo shape of the turbinate. We haven't disrupted the nasal airflow receptors. We don't have a lot of raw area for crusting, but the turbinate has been maintained in terms of its shape and we still have improved the nasal airway significantly. So really important that we identify that. We then place a little bit of surgery cell just to hold that flap laterally so the flap doesn't unwind itself during the healing period. So that's the only packing that's placed in the nose is a little bit of surgery cell just placed to hold the flap in place. So that's the technique that we'd like to use. What about the middle terminate? Usually there's a concobulosa, but sometimes a retro curved middle terminate will contribute to the nasal obstruction, excessively bulky middle terminates, excessively long in terms of the vertical height uh, of the middle terminate. So we really need to identify that. So here we have a concobulosa. When we have a concobulosa, what I like to do is I like to identify where I want that terminate to sit. So you could make your incision here and take out, leave all this but I don't actually want all of this turbinate in place. I only want a medial turbinate over here. So I'm gonna make my incision here and all of this part of the turbinate is gonna go as part of my resection of that concobulosa. So I can actually physically identify what I want that middle turbinate to look like when I do my concobulosa resection. So that you can see at the end of my um, resection, I have my uh, medial aspect of my concopulosa, but I've actually tailored that so that I can get and maximize my airflow through the middle meatus. As you could see from the physiology of the nasal airflow, a significant proportion, 60% of the nasal airflow goes through the middle meatus. So it's really important to make sure that you address the middle meatus as an area of nasal airflow when you're dealing with a patient of nasal obstruction. So when we've, we've gone through the basic surgical techniques now, now we want to make sure we can assess the patient. So the first thing you do is nasal endoscopy. So we do our nasal endoscopy uh, and visualize what we can concobulosa. Then we look at the anatomy. And the best way to look at the anatomy is to do it on a CT scan. Here, we want you to concentrate on the coronal scan and watch the coronal scan as we go through that nasal cavity. We can start to visualize the various aspects of the patient's nasal obstruction. A couple of things you can see there's a lot of nasal crowding. Uh, there's a significant issue here with the septum, the septal spur. Uh, this has occurred when the, the maxillary crest has been bent right over to more than 90 degrees right angle from the vertical of that maxillary crest. So this is probably one of the most difficult septoplasties to do because you've got this very sharp edge of the mucosa tented around that spur and because it's anteriorly based and because this here creates a problem for you to be able to create a tunnel underneath the deviated portion. Easy to get your 
mucosal plane here. Not so, so easy to get underneath and tunnel your mucosa off this below that very prominent right angle crest. So this is the most difficult septoplasty to do. So when you see this maxillary crest pushed across like that, really be aware of it. So the other thing, look at your nasal valve. So assess your nasal valve and your septum anteriorly as we go through. Make sure you look at the head of the inferior turbinate. We're starting to see that deviation come through now. Look at your inferior turbinates. How prominent are your inferior turbinates? Here we have a, the spur goes all the way posteriorly. The spur actually digs into the inferior turbinate. Here we have a large concha bullosa as well. We were looking at how much bone, the prominence of the bone in the inferior turbinate as well as we go further back. We're also looking at the sinuses. Do we have any sinus disease present as part of that um, process? What factors do we need to deal with? So here we need to deal with the septum, the inferior turbinates and the concha bullosa as part of our assessment. So we identify each of those factors that contribute to the um, uh, nasal obstruction. Chronic sinusitis and its role on your assessment of your nasal air flow is important. So minor degree of disease. So when you've got a small amount of disease in the sinuses, this doesn't really impact on the other factors, the middle inferior turbinate septum. But when you've got a high disease load and you've got a patient who's got significant chronic sinusitis, the inflammatory factors that are associated with a high disease load Cause, causes swelling of the mucosa of the nasal cavity, particularly of the inferior turbinates. So when we have a high disease load, we will very uncommonly do the inferior turbinates. Almost never will I do the inferior turbinates and uh, full house fez at the same time. I will do a mini fez and the inferior turbinates, but I won't do a full house fez and the inferior turbinates. So let's start with an easy septal deviation. So here we can see we've got a patient who's got a, a standard spur, easy deviation. He's got a retro curved middle terminate. Uh, there doesn't, there's a little bit of sinus disease, but not a lot. And so we need to ad address the nasal septal deviation and we need to address the um, concha pelosa big retro curved middle terminate, take out that spur. So this is a, what we say is a really easy, straightforward case. Really important, look how much bone this patient's got in the inferior turbinates. Significant amount of bone. Always check the amount of bone on the CT scan when you're looking at nasal obstruction and nasal airway. Because when you've got a lot of bone like that, taking the bone out, we're removing this mucosa as well. We're preserving the medial mucosa and then dealing with that inferior turbinate accordingly. So septum, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Inferior turbinates, a lot of bone in that inferior turbinate that we really need to address. Concha bullosa, chronic sinusitis, not significant. So what will we do here? We'll do the septum, the concha bullosa, and the inferior turbinates. Here's another patient. Patient's got... Uh, um, significant sinus disease. Here you can see frontal sinus disease. Also got one of these very difficult septums. So we can see that this right angled maxillary crest septum, so significant deviated septum, but a lot of sinus disease. So watch the septum as the spur comes across. You have that right angle, very difficult anterior deviated nasal septum. So septum, We'll deal with the chronic sinus disease, but we'll do the middle terminates because there's a concha bullosa. If we have a look at the concha bullosa, so we'll deal with the concha bullosa. We'll deal with the middle terminates. We'll deal with the sinus disease, but we won't do uh, the, inferior, the inferior terminates in this patient. So no inferior terminates because we've got significant sinus disease and you don't need to deal with the inferior turbinates when you have significant sinus disease. So that is really important. I've been through that. Mini-fez, 
this patient's only got maxillary sinus disease and a deviated septum. So we will do the inferior turbinates in this patient. This patient, a lot of sinus disease, we won't do the inferior turbinates. So mini fez, we will do often the turbinates with mini fez, full house fez, very rarely will we do the inferior turbinates. But we will often do the middle turbinates because the middle turbinates contribute significantly to the nasal airflow. So all septoplasty is the same, easy, difficult, and very difficult. Easy that we've been through, we've decided, told you how to do that. What about the very difficult ones like this one? We'll show you how we do that. So this is the, that deviated um, septum where the um, uh, maxillary crest is pushed over at right angles and we start to see the um, deviation. So we've um, created that um, mucosal inflammation. There's a spur here in the middle meatus, as we can see. There you can see the deviated septum away from the, the side, concha bullosa on this side, which we'll need to deal with. The patient's got a lot of sinus disease, quite an anterior nasal incision for our septoplasty, identify our surgical plane, making sure that we go back. What we'll do is we'll go through the septum, make sure that the flap on the opposite side is intact before we come and deal with the, uh, the spur on the side. So we go through the septum and then make sure that we come anterior. We often excise this cartilage, leaving the two millimeters of uh, uh, cartilage attached to the maxillary crest. Take this down right down to the floor of the nose on this side. So making sure that we are on the opposite side, we go down all the way to the floor. So sometimes when you have a very tight attachment uh, here, we will often take a scalpel blade just to make sure that we stay on the bone. So as we're coming down here onto the floor of the nose on the right hand side, using our scalpel blade just to take off this attachment here onto that maxillary crest. And that maxillary crest is now deviated. Uh, here we can see a right angle deviation of that maxillary crest. So as we said, this is a very difficult septoplasty. Take the cartilage out next and then leave the bone as our final aspect to remove this right angled uh, deviation of that makes a request. Here we take out the cartilage and we then, so once we've taken the cartilage out, we then left with this right angle deviated makes a request. We've got the mucosal flap nicely dissected on the opposite side. So here we try the important thing here, look at the angle of the dissector. The angle of the dissector is following the angle of the mucosa. Because the mucosa goes underneath this, uh, this deviated, right angle deviated maxillary crest, you've got to keep the dissector. Então, nós temos que manter o plano de dissecção no mesmo plano do desvio aqui, onde estaria a mucosa. Se você empurrar direto para baixo, você vai, vai rasgar a mucosa, você vai lesionar a mucosa aqui. É tão importante manter o plano cirúrgico no mesmo plano ósseo, do contrário, você vai é, danificar a mucosa, vai lesar a mucosa. Aí depois nós fazemos a fratura desse osso para o, o ângulo correto, e aí retiramos aquele pedaço de osso, retiramos a parte desviada até lá atrás, e aqui nós soltamos aquela parte do estourão, do, do esporão, até lá atrás, e vamos ao redor aqui do esporão, sempre descolando a mucosa, retirando a parte desviada. Aí geralmente acontece uma lesão aqui, geralmente você rasga um pouquinho a mucosa aqui, mas o outro lado está intacto, não tem problema. Aqui eu estou retirando aquela crista, sobrou um pouquinho de crista anterior aqui, vocês estão vendo, eu estou soltando aqui, fazendo a dissecção, vou retirar essa parte aqui com a lâmina de bisturi, Agora fraturamos medialmente a, a, a crista para fazer a remoção, é, eliminando dessa forma a tensão sobre a mucosa. E aqui vocês estão vendo, nós retiramos a crista. Ah, aqui está o, o, a septoplastia está concluída. Esse paciente tem doença sinusal, vocês estão vendo aqui. Então, por isso, nós não vamos fazer os cornetos inferiores, vou fazer a concha bolhosa nesse caso, vamos tratar a concha bolhosa, retirar a concha bolhosa aqui, tratá-la, e aí fazer a cirurgia sinusal, abrir todos os seios da face, a cirurgia aqui já foi feita, a cirurgia sinusal, 
Aí, e não, nesse caso, não fazemos corneta inferior. Porque esse paciente tinha muita doença sinusal. E, então, nesse caso, não acreditamos que a doença, que, que o corneta inferior esteja contribuindo para a obstrução nasal. E só a doença sinusal já vai resolver aqui fazendo a sutura de aplicatura para né, comprimir os retalhos septais, para que haja que eles colem de maneira adequada, corrigindo a incisão também do septo, ou fechando a incisão anterior do septo. Aqui é um outro paciente, aqui nós temos um paciente que tem um desvio grande, com esporão septal, concha bolhosa. Então, nós vamos ver aqui, ó, aqui é importante, esporão septal. Aqui nós fazemos a incisão, descolamos até a porção posterior do septo, vamos abordar, então, o esporão, retirar, a, preservando a cartilagem anterior, removendo o esporão aqui, a partir da porção anterior, a mucosa, vocês podem ver aqui, rasgou aqui um pouquinho. E tem um outro, rasgou um pouquinho aqui também, ó, uma outra lesão aqui. Mas aonde nós temos uma, uma, uma lesão na mucosa, a gente sutura. Onde rasgou a mucosa, a gente faz uma sutura. E aqui voltamos depois, então, para fazer o corneto. Aqui, técnica para o corneto inferior. Retiramos o osso, abrimos aqui. Adversos, as we go back. So here you'll start to see, taking the bone out, really important to remove the bone. Here we have the blood vessels, the superior medial blood vessel, inferior medial, roll that turbinate all the way back. If we um, feel that we haven't got a uh, reasonably patent nasal airway, we can deal with that um, as well. We'll show you some techniques to be able to deal with that. So what happens, uh, inferior turbinate, we really want to preserve the warming and the humidification. It's really important that we do that as part of our physiology. What happens though when your septum is straight and you've got a very narrow internal nasal valve? How do you deal with a patient who's got nasal obstruction? And this is a very prominent head of the inferior turbine. The septum straight, cartilage collapse. You've done the Cottle's maneuver to make sure that you don't have a um, external nasal valve cartilage collapse. Cottle's test is negative. We want to move the lateral wall laterally. To do that, we need to create space. How much space do we need to create? You really need to create around about two millimeters minimum. Two millimeters will often give you enough space to get that nasal valve um, significantly open. So here we will do our inferior terminal plasty procedure. We will do that uh, as we have just shown you, expose the blood vessels at the back end. Here we can see the blood vessels coming out. Um, of the back end of the inferior terminate, so taking all the bone out, remove all the bone. And then once we've taken the bone out, we'll start to visualize these vessels. So here you can see the vessels coming through the bone and taking those vessels out. But we've also got a very prominent bony shoulder here. So we preserve the mucosa. We've cauterized the back end of the inferior terminates. Here we can visualize those vessels coming through, which we will then cauterize, here we can see uh, medial, um, superior, medial, inferior vessels. We're gonna cauterize those as they come out the back. And here we've got a, still a very prominent head of the um, shoulder. So we, we wanna take the bone out. We wanna preserve the mucosa, but we wanna take the bone out. So here we just do some dissection and put a chisel in and use the chisel just to take the head of that M preserving the mucosa, but just taking the bone out from underneath that head so that we can um, improve that nasal airflow of that valve. So it's just another way of making sure that we've um, preserved the torpedo shape of the turbinate, preserved the shoulder of the turbinate, still having all the functional mucosa of the turbinate, but improving the nasal airway significantly. So this is that patient. Here we will do a pre-lacrimal approach because we've got a very narrow nasal valve. So patients had previous sinus surgery. We come across with our pre-lacrimal approach, um, making our incision onto the bone using the uh, subperiosteal plane. We'll come out and we'll identify the whole um, head of that inferior turbinate. And then we'll 
take out the bone of the inferior turbinate, the head of the inferior turbinate. And we'll take our chisel now to come back and take out the anterior aspect. You can see the blood vessels coming into view here. Um, so we even take out a little bit of the piriform aperture there. You can see the edge of the piriform aperture, taking out the whole uh, head of that inferior turbinate down to the nasolacrimal um, duct. So taking out that mucosa uh, and preserving the mucosa, but taking out the bone of the head of that inferior turbinate. So just using your osteotome, uh, dissecting out the nasolacrimal duct, we can start to see here. We go around the nasolacrimal duct, push the duct uh, laterally, take out the bone behind the nasolacrimal duct. And that allows us to push the whole of the um, lateral nasal wall further laterally to expose uh, the um, nasal valve, the internal nasal valve, and improve that internal nasal valve airway. So now we can put that back, we can put some stitches in just to hold the flap in place. But we can see that the internal nasal valve has been significantly widened by taking away that bone on using that pre-lacrimal approach. So you can see what it looks like in that post-operative period where we had a significant obstruction here now, we have a much improved uh, nasal airway after our surgery. Just in summary, really important to understand nasal airflow and the physiology of it. Really important to understand the 45 degree angle that the airflow takes as it enters the nasal cavity. Important to understand the anatomy of the inferior turbinate, the blood vessels, where they commonly occur, dissect them out. Important to know that removal of the bone on the inferior turbinate is one of the most important aspects of creating a good nasal airflow afterwards and dealing with those blood vessels so you don't have to put any packing in the nose after surgery and that you can uh, be completely safe that you're not going to get any significant bleeding afterwards. Your standard surgical techniques for septoplasty, really important to understand that you need to have two things. One, an intact flap. And secondly, you need to uh, preserve uh, the surgical plane so that you're in the surgical plane at all times. Inferior turbinoplasty technique, I think, gives a very nice result. Uh, and a really, your assessment is critical. So your endoscopy, followed by your assessment on your CT scan, of all the different factors that contribute towards that nasal airflow. Uh, we do have a Spanish uh, translation, but that won't help you for your um, um, uh, understanding of the book uh, that we've written. Um, Aldo, I think, did a translation of my book into uh, um, Portuguese. So there is a Portuguese available option for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Romo. It was a pleasure for us, this amazing presentation. I think we have our room full. That's okay, Camila. We have more than 50, 500 uh, ENT doctors from around the world, especially in the South America, uh, watching this presentation. Thank you very much. So I cannot lose our time. So I will ask you, Professor Renato Reutemann from Porto Alegre. Thank you, Renato, to, to join us here. And like open for you, you can talk whatever you want. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Aldo. Thanks, Leo, for inviting me to be in this uh, very nice panel. Thanks to the guys in the panel as well. Hi, PJ. Hey, Renato. Very nice. Yeah, very nice to see you. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was in Adelaide 13 years ago, 2007. Yeah. <laughs> Great we remember. time. We remember. Thank you, very, thank you very much. And I still have uh, the wonderful malleable instruments that allows me to dissect the front toe and at the same time to clear the surgical field. Great instruments. And congratulations on an outstanding lecture, as always. And uh, I think I'm very happy because I'm doing almost the same thing that you do. Uh, and I will concentrate my attention to the inferior turbinate because uh, we still see many patients here uh, with empty nose syndrome. And uh, I think 
you gave us a very nice message. For me, is the most important message is that the more space in the nose does not mean uh, better nasal function. That's a very important message. So if, if let's say, if you have a patient uh, with empty nose syndrome, what do you do, PJ? <laughs> That's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, unfortunately, um, touch wood, I've never seen one of my patients that I've operated on ever end up with empty nose syndrome. And I think the reason for that is that we preserve the mucosa. and We don't chop the turbinates out completely and that we understand what needs to be preserved. So I think that if you do have patients with empty nose syndrome, creating a little bit of nasal resistance by implanting either cartilage or bone or um, uh, uh, underneath the mucosa in the region of the head of the inferior turbinate, trying to recreate that torpedo shape in the head of the inferior turbinate is one of the few things that you can do to try and improve the, the uh, function of the nasal of the patient. But m most of the time, if I can, I would uh, try and avoid operating on these patients because these patients will often have a lot of psychological overlay. So I think that there is a lot of psychosomatism in these patients. And so as soon as you operate on them, they become yours for life. So uh, I would, if I can in any way uh, avoid operating on these patients, I will. So, um, you know, I do think that they are very difficult patients to manage. One more question, PJ. Uh, in the preoperative setting, do you have any tests for nasal sensation? Do you check the nasal sensation of the patient before surgery, or we cannot do that? Uh, I don't normally know because you know I think that when you assess your patient, 99% of them will have identifiable causes that you can address surgically to be able to uh, create the um, nasal cavity that's going to be optimal and functional for that patient. Uh, I think trying to predict which patients are more likely to get uh, empty nose syndrome before operating on those patients is very difficult and I probably unnecessary because, you know, I don't know how many thousands of patients I've operated on in my lifetime, but touch wood, I've never had a patient who's developed empty nose syndrome. And I think the reason for that is we, uh, uh, preserve the mucosa, we identify the critical structures that need to be addressed without actually um, uh, doing any uh, factors which will contribute towards the development of empty nose syndrome. I do think that it's really important that if you do that, the likelihood of you ending up with a patient with empty nose syndrome is very small. So the need to actually do tests uh, before surgery is, is, is really not there. Okay, Leo, can I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead, Renato. PJ, uh, let me ask you about chronic rhinosinusitis and the middle turbinate, okay? Uh, when do you, let, forget about conchabuliosa, but when do you resect uh, the middle turbinate in patients with, uh, let's say, eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis? So I, would, I, would, I used to be very conservative with the middle turbinate. I used to be a, a protector of the middle turbinate at all costs. But as I've got older and hopefully wiser, uh, I realized that the middle turbinate um, is one of the villains of the piece, especially in patients who have severe nasal polyposis. So in patients who've got uh, significant nasal polyps, I will resect the middle turbinate in almost all of those patients. And the reason for that is not only does that improve the nasal airflow after surgery, but it also allows for the um, uh, more effective um, delivery of topical steroids via your nasal wash in the post-operative period. So the problem if you've left your middle terminate behind in a polyp patient, if the middle terminate swells and becomes significantly polypoid, that obstructs the... Um, access of the wash to the frontal recess, to the ethmoid cavity, to the sphenoid, and you don't get the same delivery of the steroids into those areas. 
when I do do a resection of the inferior turbinate, a middle turbinate, I will only take the bottom half. I think it's important to preserve the rest of the middle turbinate because you preserve in not only um, the mucosa, which is important in the nasal airflow, but you also preserve in the areas where you possibly have smell uh, receptors and you want to uh, not uh, damage that sense of smell in any way. So when I do do a resection of the middle terminus, it's normally just the lower half of the middle terminus, and it's usually in patients who've got severe polyposis. I, te I tend to always preserve the middle terminus in patients who don't have polyps, who just have chronic sinus disease. Perfect, PJ. Wonderful. Take Thank care. you. Now I invite Rodrigo. So good evening, Dr. Wormald. Thank you, Aldo, Leonardo, and everybody for this invitation. It's an honor for me. So I was very impressed the way you could uh, shine some light or show your insights uh, in this subject that we always or uh, frequently take for granted or we overlook even in our uh, conferences and for our residents. Everybody thinks that this is uh, first year, second year surgery. And it's not like that, no, as you showed. So I like very much the way you show the details in the septoplasty using a scalpel uh, in the maxillary crest, for example. So that's something I'm um, looking forward for trying myself tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the way you rather fracture the spurs and the maxillary crest away from the mucosa instead of pushing down the mucosa. So that's something we do a lot here as well. And we don't know where it came from, but uh, I think those are wonderful tips and they are never shown in the conference as they should. So thank you for that. And um, um, I'll just ask one question. Um, so when you do a full house fest or a fest, not for uh, polyposis, but for a chronic serranial sinusitis without polyps, you never touch even then the inferior turbinates because we have many cases, at least here, with uh, allergic rhinitis and chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis that we do, at least I do it, um, a regular phase. And I also do something in the inferior turbinate. Uh, I yeah. like your inferior septoplasty very well. So, uh, but in the uh, with chronic sinusitis with polyps, I also tend not to do anything in the inferior turbinate because we don't know if this patient will need for the surgery in the future and resection of middle turbinate. So I think it's very important to keep the inferior turbinates in this case. But in the regular chronic sinusitis, you also don't touch them for what I understood. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's all about disease load. So in a patient where I, I feel that the amount of um, sinus disease is small, so if it's just the maxillary sinuses have uh, chronic sinusitis or the amount of disease that we have in the sinuses is small, then the contribution of the um, inflammatory products from the chronic sinusitis is small because the amount of disease is small. So in those patients, I will do the inferior terminus. But in a patient where the disease is throughout all the sinuses, so in a patient that requires what we call a full house fez, I will never do the inferior terminus because I don't believe that the inferior turbinates contribute to the nasal obstruction in the post-operative period. So I will deal with the septum, I'll deal with the concobulosa, and then I'll deal with the chronic sinus disease and leave the inferior turbinates alone. Because if you've restored the nasal function and you've taken away the inflammation and you've improved the airflow through the middle meatus uh, by your surgery, then the, we know that 60% of the airflow goes through the middle meatus. I think doing the inferior turbinates uh, it creates more risk, but also more problems for the patient in the post-operative period and in terms of healing. And I don't think the benefit is there associated with the, um, uh, the surgery that, uh, that, you, that you get uh, benefit out of that sufficient to do the surgery. So I never do them. In, I, I would say there's probably 1%, maybe 2% of my patients who after they've had a full house fez, uh, and uh, septoplasty still come back and say my nose is blocked and I can't breathe properly and I have to take those one or two percent of patients back to theater and do the inferior turbulence on those patients but 
it's quite uncommon. I would say 1% of patients, it's really quite uncommon. Okay, so just one small detail also from the septoplasty, a very basic question. When you don't have any laceration, any tearing in both sides of the mucosa, do you usually do at the end of the surgery, like, like an incision in the mucosa for preventing will, hematomas? Yeah. Or? yeah, I will very often do that. I, I go to the back of the, term, back of the septum, low down on the, towards the floor of the septum, and I make about a two centimeter incision uh, uh, and it's normally behind where I start my plication suture. So I start the plication suture below the uh, middle turbinate, and I'd really make the incision uh, for the septum behind that because I'm not sure that it actually makes a big difference, especially when you're looking at your septoplasty, if there's not a, uh, a ooze or an accumulation of blood during the surgery, uh, I think it's probably unnecessary. Uh, but I'll often do it just because, I don't know, it makes me feel better. I don't know. Yeah. But I'll often do it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Now, Miguel, your turn. First of all, I, I'd like to thank Dr. Aldo for the invitation. And hi, everyone in Brazil. It's good evening. And for Dr. PJ, it's good morning. And for me, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be a part of this panel, to be a part of this session. And I'd like to thank also Dr. P.J. Warmond for the amazing presentation. It's, uh, I suppose there are many residents, there are many people that are training uh, uh, following this session. And for them, it's very important to, to see a, a, a doctor like you or a surgeon like you showing this great presentation. And the topic is uh, very well showed by Dr. Aldo because uh, nasal obstruction, it's, a, um, it's a, a regular, it's a frequent uh, complaint in, the, in the all ENTs practice. So uh, I'd like to make a, a technical question about the inferior turbinate. Um, I observed during your surgery that I, I suppose you make the surgery with a four millimeters uh, blade. Uh, a zero degree four, four millimeters blade, but we know that there are the, the thinner one with uh, 2.9 millimeters that was designed to make the surgery inside the turbinate. But in some cases that I have a narrow uh, nasal cavity or uh, in teenagers, for example, I, I like to use, I, I, made the, I make the same uh, technique that you showed, uh, and I like to use the, the thinner uh, blade do you think that the thinner blade can, can be used uh, in some situations? And inside this question, I'd like to, to ask you, because we have many public uh, uh, hospitals in Brazil that uh, they don't have the possibility to make uh, the surgery with some technologies. So for me, the most important of the surgery is the fundamentals, the philosophy of the surgery. So in your opinion, is it possible to make the same surgery in the inferior turbinate without technology, just with the traditional equipment like uh, scissors or uh, caudal? That's the question. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Good question. Um, so as you can see, the only time that I used the uh, microdebrider blade was to create that little in initial incision on the uh, head of the inferior terminate. You can use a scalpel blade to do that. You don't have to use a debrider blade. And the rest of the surgery, no debrider blade at all, because what you can do is you can take away that mucosa on the medial surface of the um, uh, inferior turbinate just with a straight through biter. So if you've got a straight through biter, that uh, the roll, you, you know how the, the turbinate rolls like that. So if you've got the, the roll of the turbinate, you can take the roll and you can just take your straight through biter and you can go down the straight through biter taking off that roll and that'll leave you the vertical portion of the bone. So you can do the whole procedure without a, without a debrider. You um, just need a scalpel blade, a through biter, and a coddles. And then the most important instrument is a bipolar. You really need to cauterize those blood vessels at the back because you know, you've done all this uh, incision uh, surgery on the inferior turbinate. Uh, being able to cauterize the blood vessels is critical uh, so that you don't get bleeding post-operatively. But I think it also devascularizes the inferior turbinate. And that's part of that devascularization of that inferior turbinate that gives you the long-term success of the um, surgery and that you don't have significant prominence of that inferior turbinate for many years 
after the surgery because of the fact that you've taken out uh, most of the blood supply of that inferior turbinate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. And at last, uh, and the, the younger panelist, João Mangusi from Brasilia, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to first thank you very much, Dr. Stan, Leonardo, and Camila for having me here. It is uh, such a, an honor to be part of this panel. Uh, and thanks, Professor Wormold, for this terrific presentation. It was very clarifying and very instructive. Thank you very much. And uh, I have basically two questions for Professor Wormold. Uh, your videos uh, seemed bloodless. They were very nice and the dissection technique is very nice. And there was very little amount of blood. And, and my question is, what do you use for topical vasoconstrictors or uh, and injections before doing the surgery? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, yeah. We infiltrate with 1 in 80,000 lignocaine and adrenaline both the inferior, the head of the inferior turbinate, and I then take a spinal needle and I actually infiltrate the back of the inferior turbinate as well. So I use both the anterior end of the inferior turbinate and the back end of the inferior turbinate with 1 in 80,000 lignocaine and adrenaline uh, combination. Um, we use standard decongestion. You know, for us, it's a, a cocaine solution uh, topically, but, you know, if you don't have that, you could use uh, afrin or whatever you normally would use as a decongestant for that process. But um, uh, I think it's important. The injections are important for that. Obviously, your anesthetic technique is important, making sure your blood pressure and your pulse rate are controlled as well. So that's also important. Sure. Uh, do you use topical adrenaline, Professor Wormold? Yes. So, so my solution for decongestion, yeah. so we mix up a solution of two moles of 10% cocaine, yeah. one mole, one in a thousand adrenaline, and seven moles of saline. And that makes 10 moles total. And yeah. what we then do is we take a Marisol sponge and we cut the Marisol sponge into six pieces. And we put three pieces on the left, three pieces on the right, soaked in that solution. And we do that at the beginning of the surgery. And then during the surgery, we use the same Marisol sponges if we need to uh, have further decongestion during the surgery. So topical adrenaline, co topical cocaine and saline all mixed together. That's very nice. Um, my second question is in regards to those very anterior septal deviations, those deviations that are not in the bony part, but in the cartilaginous part of the septum. I mean, um, that are basically on the small leg of the l strut, on the caudal area. What do you usually do for these septal deviations? Do you do an open rhinoseptoplasty or do you do everything in the nasally? No, you can't do those. The very anterior deviations of the cartilage, you can't do endonasally. And I don't think it's a good operation to try. So I think an external septal rhinoplasty is definitely the way to go for that. And, uh, and you know, doing that external septal rhinoplasty, actually removing the whole cartilaginous septum, swinging it around and replacing it is probably the, the best option for those patients. Fortunately, it's not a common event. They, they're infrequent. So we don't have to do that too often. But uh, certainly when you do have that very anterior deviated nasal septum, it's very difficult to try and manage that endoscopically, I think. All right, thank you very much. And I hope you have a nice day there in Australia. Thank you. Great. Uh, actually, you have many, many questions from the audience. I will try to, to choose many of them. Uh, first of all, we'll have a, a question from Otavio Pilcher from Porto Alegre. He would like to know how do you address, if you address the nasal septum swell body? Do you have an experience about this? Do you think it's, it's having an impact in the nasal blockage? Yeah, no, good question. The nasal septal swell body, I don't think plays uh, a significant role. I think it's if you've taken your septum and you've um, um, done the removal of the bone of the septum, you around where the swell body is, you have significant um, bone of the uh, junction of the uh, cartilaginous septum with the bony septum. And if you've taken out the bone and cartilaginous portion of the septum at that point, that gives you enough narrowing in that area where you don't deal with the nasal septal swell body. I don't think it's uh, a good uh, process to deal with the nasal septal swell body. I, I don't think it's surgically necessary and I don't think it's wise to try to do it. 
Great. I have another question from Professor Vilma Terezinha from Ribeirão Preto, our former president of Brazilian Academy of Rhinology. She would like to know if you address the inferior turbinate in the pediatric population at the same time you do in the adult ones. Yeah, a good question. I do exactly the same in the pediatric population as I do in the adult. Exactly the same. I think it's really important that we um, preserve the turbinate, we preserve the structure of the turbinate, and that we um, uh, do the devascularization and taking out the bone. I do exactly the same in the pediatric population as I do in the adult population. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the question of septoplasty in, in pediatric patients is one which, uh, which was often is quite controversial. And my feeling is that in the very, very young patients, what I do is a septal mobilization. So what I'll do is I'll do the flaps exactly the same way um, that we would normally do the flaps, uh, uh, but without resection. So fracture the bone, fracture the cartilage, fracture everything that we need to raise all the flaps up, straighten it all up inside the nose, uh, and then uh, suture it all back together again. Great. Uh, actually, this is my, my question. Uh, I would like to know how do you address the internal valve insufficiency? Address the internal? So I didn't catch her. Internal valve insufficiency. Yeah, so the internal nasal valve, I think if you've got, as I showed you with the, um, uh, the last patient, I think that we did, when you've got a, a straight septum and you've got yeah, a very in, in narrow internal nasal valve, one of the only things that you can do with an internal nasal valve is do a pre-lacrimal approach and taking out the head uh, of the inferior turbinate, but also you can take out some of the piriform aperture bone as well, just to try and enlarge that uh, um, internal nasal valve area. And that's the only option you really have for the internal nasal valve. Okay, you have many, many questions, but I think we, we don't have enough time. So I'd like to, to invite Professor Stan to the final words. It's, it's a pity that we don't have uh, time to, to make more questions. And uh, again, I'd like to, to thank you, Professor Walmart, especially for the, 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 the early morning in Australia. Thank you again. And uh, Professor Aldo, uh, you have the, your final words. Well, uh, thank you very much, PJ. It's a fantastic lecture as usual. <laughs> uh, it's not easy to talk about nasal obstruction. Uh, nasal obstruction is the most common symptom of our patients, but not usually it's easy to solve it. So septoplasty, medial turbinate, inferior turbinate, et cetera, it's very common for everybody, but you have many complications. Here in our country, as uh, uh, Renato mentioned, it's very common to have uh, uh, empty nose syndrome. Very, very common. Oh, okay. so it's very, unfortunately, it's very common. The people remove the inferior turbinate completely and preserve the polyposis and etymoid sinus. <laughs> this is the, the new technique that I name uh, remove the normal tissue and preserve the disease. <laughs> so it, it's, it's really cool very often here in Morocco. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this is very common. And uh, how to deal with the nasal obstruction is really not, not easy to do, especially inferior turbinate. I am not against to do surgery of inferior turbinate, but not remove it completely. So it, it's, it, it's, it's incredible. But my question, the final question to you is, if you receive a patient with empty nose, with no inferior turbinates, and the patient has a lot of symptoms, do you do, you have some special technique to, do, to maybe reconstruction the inferior turbinate? Yeah, so thanks, Aldo. The, the, um, the inferior turbinate, the only thing that we can do is we make an incision like a pre-lacrimal approach, raise the mucosa off the lateral wall, where the inferior turbinate would normally be, and then either decide uh, to take some cartilage from the rib cartilage or um, uh, donate from the patient itself. You know, you need a uh, somewhere where you can get either cartilage or bone. I think I prefer rib cartilage. I think rib cartilage is the best uh, to use for this. And re really recreate an anterior end. You don't have to do the whole inferior turbinate, just the anterior end of the inferior turbinate in the region of the uh, internal nasal valve to give some resistance against the airflow uh, that the patient will then perceive 
uh, a much improved nasal airflow after the surgery. That's the only process that I can uh, give. Um, you know, uh, hopefully um, things will all settle down and that your, your meeting that you uh, have planned for May of next year, although well, we'll be able to attend, but uh, you know, and then we can, uh, we can open up all these discussions again and, and, and go through a lot more of the questions that we have. So I do thank you uh, for your invitation. Uh, today to speak and uh, hopefully we're looking forward to being able to maybe visit uh, with you in May of next year, but that'll just depend on what happens uh, uh, with our viruses. Okay, thank you so much, PJ. Again, uh, I'd like to thank you not only to PJ, but the moderator and the, all the panelists for the fantastic uh, presentation and preparation for all this talk. And uh, as well, uh, I'd like to thank you, Vamila, our coordinator. And uh, uh, my very special thank you to Marcelo. Marcelo is our ENT guy and translator. <laughs> I checked it and he did a very good job. Very good job. Congratulations, Marcelo. I like it very much. I think they did a good, very good job. He's from Brazil. And as he's from Brazil, no, he's from Belo Horizonte. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'd like to invite all of you for our next uh, international uh, ENT live stream next uh, Thursday. No, no, it's Tuesday. I'm sorry. Next Tuesday. With one of your fellow oh, PJ, uh, Richard yes. Douglas from That's Auckland. Right. Yes. It's a pleasure to have your one fellow from you here as our guest. Camila mm -hmm. stayed with him uh, last year, one year there, and uh, he's a very good connection with the, the, the Russian people from, from Sale, etc., from, from Auckland, New Zealand. So thank you very much for everybody, and I hope to see you in a very, very near future. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, PJ. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you.